really interested in nutrition and physical activity at that time. So they told us to try to find a mentor, see if we could do any research with them. A little bit more brief anyway. Um, and so I matched up with someone at, um, it was the College of Health Promotion and Nutrition. And he was a researcher working with the weight loss app called Lose It. Um, and that's when it was an app as well as a website. And what people would do is they go ahead and use it as a form to interact with other individuals that were also trying to lose weight. You could connect and log in all your nutrition and physical activity. And what I was really interested in was the idea of this participation, especially online, a little bit more anonymously, and how that would affect um, your weight loss. And I remember I talked to my mentor at that time, and I was really excited about this, and he's like, no, you shouldn't do this. This is more of a PhD thing. Like, you should do something much smaller. And I remember also walking into the building that said health promotion, and I just kept thinking, what is that? Why aren't they doing hard sciences? What does that mean to promote health? Doesn't everyone already kind of have interest in health and they want to better themselves? You know, very naive, 18-year-old in the desert. Um, and so at the time, um, I was in this huge rush to go ahead and hurry and graduate. And so I was taking all these classes in the summertime. I was trying to take as many classes as I could because I'm like, as soon as I finish school, I can start my life. I don't have to sit in classrooms all the time. So I finished in three years and then I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? I didn't actually think about afterwards. And I talked to some coworkers that I had, and this is, of course, you're really young, and they're like, why don't you do some traveling overseas? Find yourself, you know, figure out what you want to do. And he had set me up with this international program, and I went over to India. Um, believe it or not, I'm half Indian, so my dad is full Indian, and he kept promising me that we we're going to go to India once I graduated. And at the time, he was still a VP of um, pharmacy division at Kaiser Permanente. And so work was really hectic. And he's like, you know what? I don't think you should go to India anyway. It's a developing country. What are you going to do there? And so I went and I booked my ticket to go to India and do some international work for six weeks. Um, decided to tell him after the fact. He's like, you know what? I'm going to show you. I'm going to find a way to go to India. And so I ended up spending six weeks there with other people from all over the world. And so during the, I had focused on some kind of health. So you could do health or you can do education. I'm like, I don't want to be a teacher. No, that's not exciting to me. But for the health part, we ended up working at a special needs school during the day. Um, I co-taught a primary level class. So children were ages two to 16. There's 10 of them and I co-taught with a nun. Um, it was r my first interaction with special needs children and any kind of health stuff. And then we got, it, I wanted the most out of this experience in India. I didn't want to just go on vacation. I wanted to see what I could do for a community. And so we decided to try to build another partnership in that community. And that time was with another special needs, but it was an orphanage. And so at night, we would go from 5 to 6 after working at the special needs school all day. And we'd do some physical activity stuff with the children and try to get them to up and move because there's such a shortage of even nuns to help these kids get out of bed every day. So they are kind of weathering away. And one of the girls that did both these programs with me was from Australia. Her name was Mietta. And she had also done a bachelor's in biology and she was working on her master's, but we were about the same age, and she said she was doing public health. I'm like, what is that? Like, that sounds really cool, and she's telling me about epi and biostats. I'm like, there's no way we have anything like that in the U.S. That sounds really cool, but we don't have that. So as soon as I got back to the U.S., I started looking into this more. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is everything that I've been interested in. What are the odds that I haven't found this yet? And so I applied to a bunch of different schools, um, at the time, still, there wasn't that many on the West Coast, so um, I, I, even though I graduated a year early, my parents were like, you know what, you kind of, you need to leave Arizona, I don't want you just hanging out there, move home. So stereotypical millennial, I moved back in with my parents after India, and I applied for all these schools, and there wasn't really much in the West Coast in the way of um, MPH programs. There was Berkeley, there was UCLA, I was like, there's no way I'm going to get into those. 
So I just applied to some random ones. And one of them that I applied to was the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And I would gotten accepted, and I was like, I just feel this weird calling to this school. I don't know why, I just want to try something different. Let's leave the West Coast and do this. So I ended up leaving everything behind, packed up all my stuff, within a month moved to Nebraska. Um, and then part of our, and I was doing epidemiology, which I figured, you know what, let's stick to some science-y stuff, and if I want to change it, I at least will have some kind of math or science background to support myself. And so part of their requirement, or was a um, more lay requirement, there was nobody pushing you to do it, but they strongly suggested that you meet with the career advisor. So the first week I met with the career advisor, and she starts off with some of those typical questions. Tell me about your last jobs. What did you like about them? What did you dislike? And so I'm talking to her, and then she sits down and she goes, you're in the wrong field. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you need to change your concentration now. You are a health promotion person. There's no way you're going to like epidemiology. Epidemiologists just sit at their desk all day. They don't talk to anybody. You're going to be by yourself. You're going to be bored. You don't want to do it. And she was also seven months pregnant at the time. So she's like, by the way, I'm about to go on maternity leave. So you need to do this ASAP. And so I had just left everything I knew, left all my family, didn't know anybody in Nebraska, and here this woman was saying, you're in the wrong field. So I called up Mieta, I was like, what am I doing? She's like, no, 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 relax, it's fine. Let's just, you know, give it a couple months. Maybe you have to graduate a semester later because you have to retake some courses because you change your concentration, but just see what happens. And so a couple weeks later, Dr. Solomon came to one of our classes and talked about the CEASE program. And I always had this interest in cancer, but I thought it's probably more of the bench sciences people, the ones that wanted to take organic chemistry, those people are the ones doing cancer. And Dr. Solomon's like, no, you don't need to have any background. And by the way, there's this opportunity for you to go abroad. I'm like, oh, I just can't wait to go back. I need to talk to him. This is going to be great. Um, and so I ended up talking to Dr. Solomon about that program, and we went to Tanzania. There were six of us, and one of the things I still tell people to this day, my favorite thing about CIS was building this relationship with the people that I went to Tanzania with, but as well as the people that were in the CIS program. And it's just so crazy to see how much CIS has changed. So during that time, we were required to do cancer courses, all of us that were in the CIS program. So two semesters, we were all sitting there together, so we had a lot of time to bond and build these connections. So now a lot of us have been at each other's weddings, we've seen kids being born, and we talk about mentorship, and some of my best mentors had been my peers, because I'll see what mistakes we make, what we do well. Um, even when I was applying to PhD programs, we could send each other our personal statements and get advice. Um, so I went to Tanzania, and Dr. Solomon had talked about how um, our initial project was to look at the newly implemented cervical cancer screening clinics in two rural areas, so Chilinzi and Bagamoyo, as, and then are those patients that are going to these clinics, once they get diagnosed or have suspected cervical cancer, what did they do next? Do they actually go to the treatment center, and how does that happen? And I remember we had this great plan like everyone else, you know, you have this great research question and it's going to be this great success and then you get in the country and everything instantly changes. And you start digging in medical records and you're like, none of this is feasible, what am I going to do? I remember this happened to every single one of us in Tanzania. We all were calling Dr. Solomon as soon as we would get internet, what do we do? How do we deal with this? And there's this huge time difference, so he's not always available. He's trying to help other CIF students. And so that was kind of this time that you learn to be way more independent and you need to start to problem solve on your own. And so this is something that's helped me all the way to my PhD now that I never thought would impact me the way it did. Um, Dr. Solomon also asked me to talk about publication. And I've talked to a few of you about this, so my like everyone else, our hope was to finish your manuscript before you graduate, get it over with, you know, but it's not always feasible. So in my mindset, I was like, I want to get 
my capstone finish. I need to start to schedule when I'm going to defend this so I can get out of here and move on to the next thing. Um, at the time, I also had, so I was doing CEAS, I was doing um, the MPH program, and I also had signed up for two other jobs because why not? I didn't have much public health experience in opportunities kept knocking on my door and I couldn't say no. So one of them was with, um, thankfully for that career advisor who told me I shouldn't do epi, she also helped me um, land a job with AmeriCorps. So it's like the Peace Corps, but you did it in America. So I could do multiple things at once and I got to teach nutrition education in special populations. So I would go into minority um, schools, so schools that were, had lower income students and we would start to talk about um, what is healthy eating, how do you cook better, how do you budget, so we'd help teen moms, help how do you feed your kids, um, we'd also do after school curriculum, and that's when I'm like, okay, teaching isn't so bad, this is kind of fun. I also had an opportunity to work at the local health department. If you ever have any kind of opportunity to even spend I don't know, a month there and work with these individuals. It's really eye-opening of what's going on in the community and things are just so different at the local level versus in academia versus even in some of the developing countries. But the things that you need to learn are kind of the same. So I had both these jobs and I was working on that manuscript, kind of finished it graduated and or I was about to graduate and I came to Dr. Solomon again I'm like I want to do a PhD program I know I want to do this my dad really pushed me a big thing that he said at Kaiser was education so at the end of the day sometimes the, it, when they look at you your application another application you might have more experience but sometimes Kaiser specifically will look and say well you have a PhD so I'm gonna give you this promotion so it was really important to my dad and he kind of stressed that to me and obviously everyone wants to be called doctor you know like you want that higher level of respect so I talked to Dr. Sullivan I was like I want to do a PhD or actually first I talked to our chair of admissions for the PhD program and she's one of those individuals it's really hard to read her facial expressions so she sat across from the room and she's like why do you want to go here I'm like well it's nebraska you know i already live here so let's do it i'm really interested in more and she asked some really hard questions of you don't want to go to a different school and expand your network you're not married you don't have any children why do you want to stay here why do you want these same professors um same partnerships why don't you want to go anywhere else I think you really need to talk to Dr. Solomon. So I talked to Dr. Solomon, like, I really want to do this. And he's like, okay, I'll make you a deal. You go work for a year and then come back to me and I'll write you a letter of recommendation. I felt that, like that was kind of like another father saying, hey, go get a job, like then we'll talk and you can work on other stuff. And so talked to him a little bit and he's like, why don't you see if you can find anything in cancer? And at the time, the state health department had a cancer position and the gentleman was 55. He had been there for 20 years in this position. I'm like, oh my gosh, and that's the only cancer epi over there. I don't really want this data analyst job, but I'm gonna just start applying for all the positions I can find before my AmeriCorps position is up because they do a service scholarship, so you can only work with them for two years, and then you kind of have to move on. So I applied for a bunch of very random jobs um, everywhere from like Blue Cross to academia and I dealt with a lot of rejection which is not always a bad thing sometimes it leads you to, to where you're supposed to be so I was starting to stress because I had about two weeks left um, I was also working in a clinic for the local health department doing um, because I had the experience with CEASE they had um, an issue with their electronic health record they went for an open source um, vendor so you don't have to pay anything and they entered everything and then they went to run how many diabetic patients they had and it said zero he's like no I'm in South Omaha which is a pre predominantly Hispanic area there's no way I have zero um, diabetics and what happened is you needed to go in the medical record and enter in the diagnosis date for all those patients and because I had dealt with paper records before and I wanted to learn some electronic health record stuff they had given me that position 
And he said, you know what, when your position's up, I can go ahead and pay you to help me finish this project while you look for jobs. So I was waiting around and within two weeks I got offered or I did a couple of job interviews. So one of them was at the state health department. It was for a nutrition coordinator position. It really recommended that you have an RD, so registered dietitian. And I sat in the room and then they end the um, conversation. They go, hey, off the record, can we ask you some stuff? Like, uh-oh, what does this mean? Like, what? <laughs> and they go, are you still interested in epidemiology? Of course, yeah, like, that's my passion. Like, are you okay leaving the cancer world? I'm like, yeah, you know what? Like, you guys do some really cool stuff. They're like, well, we have this position that we're trying to fill. It hasn't officially been posted yet, but we really like you, and it sounds like you know how to deal with the health promotion world. You know how to deal with people. You know the importance of educating in the community. You know at all these different levels. So I'm gonna go take your resume to HR if you're okay with that. And so I really recommend um, talking to as many people as you can, networking, because you never know where it's gonna get you. So because I had done that position, I got pushed to the front to do the chronic disease epidemiologist position at the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, which really, in the job description, it said they really wanted a PhD um, candidate. And I was really hesitant that they weren't gonna hire me because I, Dr. Solomon told me not to get a PhD yet. So um, I ended up getting a call and I was offered three different positions at three different organizations at the same time because I had just applied so much. And the chronic disease epidemiologist one was my dream one because it was not only working on nutrition, physical activity, heart disease, diabetes, so everything that I had done in the world in one, and even accepting the position I knew is something that was way above what I was qualified for, but it was gonna make me work a lot harder to prove myself. Um, and so when I was over there, it was a very unique position that's at all state health departments throughout the US, um, and they're organized slightly differently. So I had a team of 11 of us, and I was the sole epidemiologist on two major grants. So we were pulling in over $3 million each year, working with six health department, local health departments, and I was advising them on chronic disease epidemiology. I was working with 25 external partners, advising them on chronic disease epidemiology, and I had to really learn to get rid of this um, research, research, research mindset. And um, like they had talked about earlier, translating things for the general public to understand, which was a huge skill set for me. Um, and so during that time, I spent a lot of um, time doing different fact sheets. And I also got to work with some academics doing a couple manuscripts through that part, and that's when I kind of started to think about, wow, maybe academia isn't so bad. Um, I had a very unique position where I was under the Department of Epidemiology and Informatics, but I was housed in the Health Promotion Unit, so I had to learn to work with two different groups of people, so I had to work with those epis and biostats and speak that language, and then translate it to my Health Promotion Group, and at the time, um, there wasn't a state chronic disease epidemiologist that was supposed to be me, so I didn't have any kind of mentorship. So there's this organization called um, Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists that kind of directs all the local health departments and state health departments, and they had this really cool opportunity for a applied chronic disease fellowship. And during the time that Dr. Solomon had said um, not to go to a PhD, I had applied for a fellowship at CDC doing chronic disease epi and I had been rejected. So it was very weird to go full circle and now be at the state applying for one, which I ended up getting. So I was matched with another chronic disease epidemiologist at a different state health department and again got to work with different epis throughout the U.S. Um, so... Ooh. During, so after that is when I got a lot more mentorship and I started to talk to that mentor again of do I want to do epidemiology or health promotion and talking to her she's like no 
everything you're talking about is epi focus so part of my projects for that fellowship you have to do a project I learned GIS and so we looked at different methodology of how you calculate um, quote unquote reach in GIS which piqued my interest of wanting to do reach as my dissertation topic. This idea of how many people have access to healthcare or just because you live over here, um, is it easy to travel this way? Um, so after that, I had felt that I kind of reached my maximum capacity at the state health department because the only way to go up was to get a PhD and then become that quote unquote state health department. But with that, you'd also have to secure your own funding. Um, during that time was also when our grants were ending. So again, was not qualified, but I helped our state, myself and the evaluator wrote five CDC grants as well as other organizations. We um, secured all five grants for them so that's something that you're, it's hard to write in academia for grants because they really do look at your bio sketch, what's your publication record, they want to know all this stuff. But when you're writing with CDC, um, it's a little bit different. You have more support, um, the competition's different. So there's no way that I would have gotten this grant writing experience anywhere else. Um, so right now I am at Oklahoma. I contacted Dr. Solomon again, hey, I'm ready. Um, part of how I know quite a few of you are in your PhD, so part of how I decided was after living in Nebraska, I only wanted to live somewhere warmer. I couldn't handle the snow anymore, so that took away a lot of schools. And then I told Dr. Solomon, I only want to do chronic disease epi. I'm not sure I'm ready to give up cardiovascular disease. I want to do cancer. I want to do a strong thing there. Um, and then I also want to do GIS, which not a lot of schools can offer or have faculty that have money or time to work with you. And I've talked to a couple people of, you apply for these different schools and you get it rejected, but sometimes that's not a bad thing. You end up exactly where you're supposed to be. So I've talked to the other PhD students in my cohort and we work really well together. We have a lot in common and it's more of my style. I think some of the other schools students get very competitive and that's not me. I want to work together with my team of how do we help each other. And another thing I was looking for was a department that had biostats and epidemiology as one department because you are forced to work together more often. So like they said, uh, find um, a biostatistician and be friends with them. That was easy for me because they're in my department, they're in my office. So anytime I have a question, just tap on their shoulder, ask them a question, so it's a great opportunity. Um, Dr. Solomon also asked me to talk a little bit about what I'm doing now. So I am doing a lot with GIS, as well as starting to do some lung cancer stuff. Um, talked about becoming friends with a biostatistician, but also become friends with someone in med school. They can offer you a lot about what's going on in clinics and how clinicians are seeing, what they're seeing, that sometimes you have to sift through a lot of data or sometimes they can offer another insight of why that's happening. So talking to some of my friends, I got really interested in lung cancer. Um, we also have a big issue with tobacco and lung cancer in Oklahoma, so it seemed to fit. Um, I think that's it. I'm gonna stop rambling now.